Rachel asked me if I would give a talk about some of the fossils in the Darling Range. And as perhaps many of you know, the Darling Range is very old. The rocks here are extremely old. They're two, three billion years old. And there really weren't many things living on Earth at that time. But there are some really interesting fossil deposits, which I'll talk about, scattered along the range. But what I thought I would do is sort of extend the concept of the Darling Range a little bit. When you actually look up what is the Darling Range, it's very vague. There's the Darling Scarp, and because it's so vague in terms of what I could find, the definition of it, I thought, that's okay, I can go a fair way north. So I'm going to go a long, long way north, and we're going to start in, if it'll work. So we're actually, I'm actually going to start, sorry, I'll just get used to this thing in Kununurra. Now the reason I'm starting in Kununurra, you might think this is a really extreme extension of the Darling Range. Okay, <laughs> I know, I know. I'll come back to this map in a moment, but it's because about three, four months ago, um, we were sent in the WA Museum some photographs from a lady called Di Brooks, who very kindly supplied this particular photograph, of some fossils she'd found about <coughs> 300 kilometer, 30 kilometers, sorry, um, east of Kununurra and if you can see it there it looks a bit like sort of lizard skin or a snake skin but what it is is the impression of the trunk of a tree that lived in these rocks well li it lived in this area is now preserved in the rocks that are about 380 million years old and these are the remains of these called lycopods or club mosses and this is the modern one the modern ones grow to about I don't know, this sort of height, but when you get back into the, um, the Devonian times, 350, 380 million years ago, they grew to about 30 meters tall. And what Di and her husband found were this whole area covered by these great trunks of these trees. It's a new discovery made by an amateur, somebody who's not a professional paleontologist. Uh, most of the localities I'm talking to you about tonight were found by people who live out on the range of various places, um, farmers who are out and just find these strange looking rocks with, oh, it's a bit like a fossil. So they'd send them into the museum and we'd say, this is fantastic, can we come and have a look? We'd go and then you know, a whole load of research would develop from this. This is, you know, real people science. It's been going on for a long time. I mean, the sort of 30 years I was at the museum, this would happen very frequently. Um, so if you're ever out and about looking in the rocks because you might find something new, there's still lots to be found in Western Australia. Okay, so tonight what I want to talk about are two main areas. I'm going to talk about this area in the Darling Range. You probably can't read very well. There's a locality at a place called Whalabing, which is near Mora. Um, Cogen up at a few other places. The closest to us here is Westdale out on the Brookton Highway. So I'm going to talk quite a lot about fossils from here, and these are all fossil plants that we've found here. But I'll, before I get onto those, I want to talk about a new discovery or newish found near Calbarry because it's sort of it's a similar sort of preservation, and it sets the sort of scene for the development of the plants down here. So I want to talk about these different fossils. I want to show you how they occur as fossils in Western Australia. I'll talk about the method of the fossilization. I'll talk about the rocks themselves. And what I want to sort of stress is what can we glean from these particular fossil plants? Can they tell us what the environment was like in these two instances for these ones down in this area on the Darling Range around about 40 million years ago? and the Calbarry ones are about 130 million years. What can these fossil plants and what can the rocks themselves tell us about the environment? Can they tell us something about the climate? Um, because this is one of the major things that as paleontologists we do. We look at various things. We look at evolution of animals and plants. We look at in changing environments. And one of them particularly, and this is obviously of interest to people these days, are changing climates. And you can read a lot about what climates were like from the fossils, from the rocks. So I'll touch on this quite a bit as I go through the talk. But it's also a good chance for me just to show you this wide range of fossils that we have. Now, hopefully in the new, new museum, which should appear theoretically at the end of 2020, there'll be a few of these plants on display. And in fact, with a bit of luck, this specimen will be on display. 
we convinced them it took quite a lot of battling to do that we should have some fossil plants in the display to tell us a little bit about the evolution of the amazing flora that we have in Western Australia. And they were finally convinced. Okay, so what I want to start with is I'm going to Calbarry, but the time at Calbarry before there were plants, because this will all become sort of vaguely clear, I hope. And many of you have probably been to Calbarry. It's a fantastic place, the gorges, the sandstones, the red sandstones, which are called the Tumblagoola sandstone. In these sandstones, there are all sorts of fossils, not fossil plants, but fossil tracks. And this is another whole talk I'll give you some time if you want to hear about the fossil tracks. It's the, probably the best place in the world to see the evidence for animals colonizing land about 440 million years ago. There are trackways made by giant scorpion-like animals. And some of these scorpion-like animals grew to longer than me, would you believe? And they left their tracks and traces in a lot of the stands, sands. And here's my daughter peering at some ripple mark sands with a track of an animal. It looks as though it's walked across a couple of days before, but no, it was 40, 40, 440 million years before, probably, give it take a week or two. At this time, there were very few plants on land. There were probably mosses and lichen, so-called lower plants, but there were no vascular plants, the ones that have xylem and phloem and can up, you know, hold themselves upright, like you know, eucalypts and banksias and daffodils and cabbages and so on. They didn't appear until after these sands were deposited. So this was a world where there was very little vegetation, so there were lots of rivers weathering the land, transporting all these sands into a sort of tidal area where lots of these animals were wandering around. So if you go to Calbarry, and this is Nature's Window is there, which probably some of you have been to, um, you can walk out on this ridge here, there's a track that runs all down here, and you're basically standing on a tidal sand flat that's 440 million years old. Fantastic views down into the gorge that way and down into the gorge that way because the Murchison River does a great big meander there. If you go to the coast, you go south of Calbarry, south of Red Bluff, you get the same sort of thing, all these amazing sandstones. What used to confuse me a lot, I must admit, is that the sandstones here are a bit, the ones on the surface, way up on top of the cliff, are a little bit different. And people would periodically contact the museum in the 30 years I was there and say, oh, I found this bit of fossil wood at Calbarry. And I'd say, what, fossil wood? Okay. And they'd tell me about a little bit of fossil wood or they'd bring it into the museum and we've got a few pieces. And I'm thinking to myself, why is there fossil wood in these sandstones that are meant to be 440 million years old. This is meant to be before there were trees and things like this, very odd. So uh, me and other paleontologists have largely ignored this. And then, I don't know, it must be about getting over 20 years ago, I got a letter with a photograph in it from a geologist who'd been there on holiday and said, ah, oh, I found this fossil, it looks a bit like a fossil banks here in the sandstones to South Calbarry. I thought, what, that sounds, this is another weird one. So I dashed up there with my daughter Katie, who you saw in the previous slide, and we spent a couple of days and we located where this guy had found this particular little fossil plant, and then we found some more, and we found some more, and we realised that there were a lot of fossil leaves here that were obviously much younger than these 440 million year old rocks. Okay, so if you go south of Calbarry, around Red Bluff, and you wander around, in fact, if you wander around a lot of the Calbarry area, You've got the, I keep pushing the wrong one, sorry. This old sandstone here, <clears throat> but it gets very weathered. You can see over the thousands of years, the sand has weathered and you get these patches of just loose yellow sand. And they used to use it um, for the track that goes out to, for, to the loop and the Z bend. It's been sealed now, but they used to use this yellow sand. And that's from the deep weathering of this sandstone. And it's been doing this for a very long time. Whenever these rocks have been exposed, you've had this deep weathering. What seems to have occurred probably about 130 million years ago is this, there was loose sand on the surface and what it's done, it's all cemented together. So here's a view south of Red Bluff, looking to the sea. Here is the tumbling of sandstone. This paler colored rock 
is the rock that's got the fossil plants in and it's incredibly hard and it's called a silcrete and I brought some specimens along so you can have a look afterwards <coughs> it's called silcrete because it's like concrete it's probably harder than concrete it's made of silica and it forms under very peculiar climatic conditions and it's very common in rocks of this sort of age across a lot of Australia you get this really really hard um, silcrete and what we'll find is that in the rocks on the Darling Range, in which we've got the fossil plants, different types of fossil plants, they are also preserved in this same stuff called silcrete. So when you look at the locality, here are some of the sandstones. And if you've been to Red Bluff, you might have seen there are things like organ pipes, which are trace fossils, burrows made by animals 140 million years ago. But on top is this silcrete, this concrete-like sand. So if you take yourself back to about 120 million years ago, a time where there were obviously plants growing here, there would have been pterosaurs flying in the air, there would have been dinosaurs wandering around here, and on that surface where there were dinosaurs walking, there were sands, and something about the climate meant that these sands were getting turned into this really hard silcrete. I'll explain why and how that occurs briefly in a minute. When you get down on your hands and knees and looking for fossils, you tend to think, oh, you find a fossil in a rock, you get your hammer and you bang a rock and there's a fossil that comes out or there's a big dinosaur bone or whatever. Most of looking for fossils, particularly in West Australia, it seems you have to get down on your hands and knees. And a colleague of mine from England showed me the best way to do this years ago. Basically said, you put your nose to the ground, bum in the air, and then you find the fossils. And that's what you have to do here. And here you can see a nice 10 cent coin, coin for scale. There is little lines here and there's a weird spiral. These are all little fragments of plants that are in this very hard silcrete. So these aren't 440 million years old, they're much younger. How do we know they're much younger? We know they're younger because we use the fossils themselves to give us an indication of the age, and I'll come on to that in a moment. So here's this silcrete, and here's one of the fossils that's a bit more recognizable. You can see it here. This looks just like a fern, and it looks just like a fern because it is a fern. And the way it's preserved, the way all these fossils are preserved is just impressions. The actual leaf has disappeared, but what happened? The leaf just fell into the sand, well, it was still soft sand, it left an impression, and then the sand has hardened into the silcrete. Now this particular specimen here, it's not a bad one, it's been exposed to the air for a long time, but I'll show you a nice one in a minute, which we found from breaking open the rocks. Um, we were actually able to identify the species of fern, and it's exactly the same as one that occurs in the broom sandstone. So the sands around Broome, these are famous for the dinosaur footprints they have. And these have a date of around about 130 million years old. And this is based on the particular plants that occur in these sandstones. And there are a few, quite a few species that we've identified in these rocks at Carberry that are really the same species as the ones in Broome. So we're pretty confident this is the age of these particular plants. Now, 130 million years ago is before flowering plants. Flowering plants appeared probably about 120 million years ago. So we're seeing the last of the, the flora that was around um, when the dinosaurs were around, but before flowers actually um, appeared. So where was Calberry? Where was Western Australia 130 million years ago? Here's a reconstruction and Australia is down here. So it's quite high latitude, it's much closer to the South Pole than today. It was attached to other continents, it was attached to Antarctica, it was attached to Southern Africa and India. It was part of this great continent called Gondwana. But you'd think, well, it's right down here close to the South Pole. It would have been very, very cold. That's not the case. If you go back 130 million years the world was in a greenhouse world there is a lot of evidence for this it was much much warmer than it is today so ocean temperatures down in this area 26 degrees that sort of subtropical temperatures in the low latitudes around the tropics 
The oceans were about 35 degrees. It was very warm. The whole world was very warm. It was a very hot and at times a very wet world. And that's why the silkrete formed. And this next slide I apologize for. It's the only one that's got lots of words in it, but it's here mainly to remind me to tell you what to say. These silcretes, they're terrestrial silcretes. In other words, these rocks form on land. They form exactly where the sand was over hundreds of millions of years ago. And they're very common, as I say, about 130 million years ago, and lots in rocks about 40 million years ago. And what happened was silica is dissolved. Silica, which is in granites in particular, very slowly dissolves over time. Now, when you have very high CO2 levels in the atmosphere, the water gets more acidic, it's much, much hotter, there's much more rain around, you have much more chemical weathering of granites and things going on, and you get a lot of silica dissolved in the groundwater. So the groundwater itself, when it's very wet, rises up into these sands that are forming, where the dinosaurs have been wandering through all these plants. During the winter months, in the, in the, in the summer months rather, in the winter months at that time, it got very dry, it was still very hot, but this silica that's in the groundwater crystallized out and started binding these sands together to make this hard silcrete, silcrete. Now the best analogy for this is what I call the wet teaspoon in sugar thing. You know, if you commit the heinous crime of stirring your tea with the sugar that you got from the sugar bowl, and then you put that wet teaspoon back in the sugar bowl, you come the next morning, what's happened? You've got that cemented sugar on the teaspoon and it's exactly the same process you've had a little bit of dissolution of the sugar and then it's recrystallized overnight to form a harder rock and that's really all that silcrete that's the process to form um, silcrete so it's a really strange climate very hot in the summer very wet but still really quite hot in the winter but very dry so very extreme seasonality and yet Australia was in very high latitudes. So in the winter months, not a lot of sunshine, but very, very long days in the summer. So there really isn't a comparable climate today. So here we are, these rocks. What are the fossils that get in them? The ferns, there are lots of different types of ferns. Um, and I've got a specimen, in fact, I think it's actually this one in a block in the box I'll get out afterwards. These are called dipto, dip. Dipteridacean ferns, here is a modern one here. Um, and these are ones from Calabari. This particular species here occurs in the broom sandstone as well. And these are quite common in these Calabari sands. Um, Osmundacean ferns like Osmundia, this fern here, which is a common fern today. Here you can see the specimens here. It's amazing, these things get preserved. They're falling, and basically what's happening is they're literally the plants are just falling down into the sand, getting covered by sand when it's dry, wind blown, then it gets wet, and then it turns into the rock. It hasn't moved anywhere, they haven't been transported. They're literally being fossilized more or less where they grew. So there's quite a diversity of these um, particular um, types of ferns. This is one of these classic ones. The rock's very hard and we'd find a few specimens lying around. But a lot of the time you've got to break the rock open. The only hammer we had to break open this rock is a hammer we call the Beast, which is about a seven pound sledgehammer. And fortunately my sons in particular who were quite strong in, in their youth and would wield this hammer and occasionally the rock would palm split open. And this is one of the more spectacular ones. And this is the first time this fern has seen the light of day for 130 million years. And the preservation is fantastic in that you, you, you've got the red color is where the plant tissue was. And that's just because there are iron oxides that are preferentially formed where the actual leaf material was. Interestingly, this one's got bits broken off. So I think something had a chew at this. Maybe it was a little dinosaur or something had a chew at the fern before it was fossilized. Here's a really weird looking fern, but the same thing occurs in the Broome sandstone, a thing called Robachia, which was named after Roebuck Bay. So lots of ferns. There are also weird things, a group that don't exist today, that were like cycads superficially, but are called seed ferns, have this terrible name, Bennett Italians, but they're seed ferns. So they're like ferns, they're like cycads, but they're a fern that doesn't have um, spores, they actually have seeds. Um, and it's thought they could be distant relatives of flowering plants. These are very big. This thing's probably about 10, 12 centimetres long. Sorry, I haven't got a scale on it. 
Um, but lots of these um, different types with these big pinules. This one here, we put a name on it, Otosomitis bengalensis. And I've got one of these in the box here. And the name tells you something about the fact that the species was named from specimens found in India. And remember, this time 130 million years ago, Australia was attached to India. India was moored off the coast here, it was moored off Bunbury. And about, around about 130 million years ago, it started to split away and it moved across and whacked into Asia about 65 million years ago. But it's the same species occurring in India as in Kalbarri. These things here, these are conifers, a long stem of a conifer. There's another one curling around there. These are bits of aracariation conifers. So things like the aracarias, the monkey puzzle trees, the bunya pines. These are quite common. And here's a modern aracaria stem and you get the fossilized stem. Again, just the impression of these things. If you've got some plasticine or latex and you put it into this, then you get out what the thing actually looked like. The other weird things we started finding at first thought, what on earth are these? Until we realized these are the seed scales. The seed of our acariations are at the end, they have a big scale on them. And this is about, sorry, there's no scale again, probably two or three centimeters long. We rapidly realized that when we find one of these, we'd find two or three or four. You'd get little clusters of them. And the reason for that is, again, because the cone fell off the tree, fell on the ground, and what happens with aracariation cones, unlike you know, um, Scots pines and these where the cone stays as a, a, a distinct entity, they just fall apart. And this is best shown by the good old bunya pine. And here's a bunya pine in Rolystone. In fact, it's in our garden in Rolystone. And for years, very nice, we've got a bunya. And then a few years ago, it suddenly decided it would produce some cones. And about two, three years ago, it produced about a dozen cones. And there's my foot for scale. If you haven't seen a bunya pine, they're very impressive. And you could say what ha see what happens when they fall apart. You get the cluster of seed scales, just like in the fossil. One day we collected, picked up three of them, we put them by the back door, we went out shopping or something, <clears throat> came back in the afternoon, we thought somebody had come and been ransacking the house because the thing had all been fallen apart. But what happens? The sun had got on them and they just, bleh, they just fall apart. So that's obviously what was happening to the fossils. When those bunya pines fall apart, all that's left in the middle is this sort of stem bit and you find this in the fossils as well. There are lots of things in these sands we don't know what earth they are. There are various seeds because these, rock, these haven't been studied. There's been no proper study undertaken. There was an honours thesis done by a student who found a lot of really good material in new localities, but the, the, the um, research hasn't progressed very far. But these are different seeds that have turned up and we don't know what they are. Some of these look as though possibly you've got ancestors of some of the flowering plants in here. It's hard to know. <coughs> there are lots of leaves that we don't know what they are. Big sort of tricuspate leaves. Um, so it's awaiting a paleobotanist to study these things. Then we have, and I showed you this in the very first slide of the fossils, these really enigmatic spirals. And they're really quite common. They're about, that's probably about two centimetres across. That's about three centimetres. The only thing we can think of is perhaps they're a bit like, and you know, ferns before they open up, they're all coiled up, that it's something like that. Don't know what they are. When you look at the proportions of things in this deposit, the majority are different types of ferns, about 45%. The seed ferns, about 25%, and about 25% of the, the conifers. So if you want to know what it looked like there, here's a reconstruction. This is based on a site in America, but it wouldn't be too dissimilar. Basically a forest with a lot of aracation pines. Here are the seed ferns down here growing and a lot of smaller ferns down at ground level. Here are some strange reptiles frolicking in the foreground. So that's roughly, I think, what cow barry would have looked like 120 million years ago. Okay, let's leap forward in time 40 million years. What's happened to the Earth? Well, it's the continents continue moving. Gondwana's splitting up. Africa's gone its own way. India, as I say, left Australia. Um, it's, it's hit Asia and started to form the Himalayas. 40 million years ago, it's just before the break of, 
South America and Antarctica. Once that break took place, you had this current got going around Antarctica, and that's one of the reasons why the Earth has gone into this ice current ice age that we're in. Australia is still quite a high latitude, not far off Antarctica, but on its way roaring north up into Indonesia, in fact to form Indonesia and the islands up here. And we're still going north at about the rate our nails grow or hair grows or something, about nine centimetres a year. Okay, we've reached the Darling Range at last. The locality is, as I mentioned, is Whalabing. It's a little settlement outside Mura. There's another side of Kalingari. There are a few odd patches that are on the Darling Range in these very ancient rocks. There are these silcretes. Now, if you go to some spots in the Darling Range today and you walk through the, the Jarrah Forest and other places, you can come across these patches of sand. The same thing, that the, the granitic rocks on the Darling Range, very old. They've been there an incredibly long period of time. Nothing happens geologically in Western Australia. It's just gone up and down a little bit and the seas come in slightly, you know, the last three billion years. There's been intense weathering. And so you get these patches of sand, they're still forming today. It is in these similar patches of sand 40 odd million years ago that the plants were dropping their leaves, they were <coughs> dropping their fruits. <coughs> there are also other sites down at um, Kojunup as well. Here is a typical example of this particular site at Whaler being it's on top of a hill. As I say, it was the local um, landowner found it, contacted us, and we went up and did quite a few field trips up there and collected hundreds and hundreds of these beautifully preserved leaves. Again, okay, I've got a couple of specimens here you can look at. So you've got this very hard grey silcrete rock in which are preserved leaves. Now the leaves are impressions and sometimes the silkrete is very finely preserved and as I'll mention later on it's so well preserved you can get the cellular structure preserved in them, in them as well. So what do these leaves tell us about the climate? The rock is indicating it's still very hot and wet alternating with hot and dry periods and it's known that 40 odd million years ago CO2 levels in the atmosphere three four times higher than now temperatures much higher it was a greenhouse world before we sort of plunged into the the ice age of the last um, few millions of years it's a very diverse flora again hasn't been properly studied and I had another student when I was teaching at Curtin who did a really good honours project and we're hoping to carry this on but there is an amazing diversity of plants and the plants are really interesting because there are ones that are similar to ones growing in this area today but there are a lot of other ones that don't they're not growing in this part of the world some are not even growing in Australia as I'll show you but these are all different types of banksias, banksia dryand or whatever I'm calling them, or banksias. So you see a high diversity in leaf form, some one with very little serrations on the edge, others with very big serrations, it's very curvy ones here. And this is just some of them. So there could be at least a dozen different species. We've described one of them, which I'll come back to in a minute. So if you look at a modern, this is just some random photographs I took up at Kings Park. It's a similar sort of diversity of fossil leaves, Banksia leaves, 40 million years ago as there are today. Banksias have been around a long time. They've been around probably 60, 70 million years. Um, Rachel mentioned that I found the first, the oldest fossil Banksia fruit. And this is part of the story in a way. Going back quickly up north to Kennedy Range, on top of Kennedy Range, you get silcretes. And when I first came to WA in 1979, I headed off there on a field trip, mainly because in the 1960s, somebody had found a specimen of a, what looked like the impression of a banks here. We wandered around this area for two, three days, couldn't find anything. And this is the evening we had arrived. The day we were due to go, we were due to pack up camp in about an hour. I said, oh look, there's this one mesa I want to go and have a look at. The other went, all right, if you must. So I wandered over there and there was this boulder, a boulder of good old silcrete, and in it, with the Bryant and May matches here, is the impression of 
a Banksia cone. Yippee! I'd walked over there, it's about a kilometre. This was on a block and you couldn't really get the vehicle there, which is big. So I nearly killed myself getting it back, but I wasn't going to leave it there. Because when we got it back and we poured latex into it, pulled the latex out, puffed ammonium chloride on it to get a nice contrast, took a photograph, this is the amazing Banksia cone that came out. This is 40 odd million years old. I took this in to colleagues, show colleagues in the herbarium, and they went, what, this is ridiculous. They assumed that Banksia's that far ago would be very simple, unlike modern ones. Well, this, we ended up calling this Banksia archaeocarpa. You know, your Greek means old fruit. This is a modern Banksia, you may recognize Banksia attenuata, the yellow flowering Banksia, and it's very, very similar. The bracts are slightly different shape, but they're, they're very close. This is a plaster cast we made of the same specimen. You'll notice that these are the follicles that have the seeding. And you know the follicles on banksias are wood. They're hard wood, they're connected to the woody center of it. They're incredibly hard to break. This one's missing, it's gone. This one's broken. broken. What gets stuck into these today? <laughs> cockatoos. So is this, I ask, indirect evidence for the existence of cockatoos in Australia 40 million years ago, unless there was some other animal that is now extinct that had the ability to get into the seeds to break them down. Other plants in the whale being deposit, there are a lot of leaves which look a bit like grevilleas. Trying to identify grevilleas on leaves is a bit um, a dubious thing to do, but we haven't found any um, fruiting bodies. Um, here's another one, but this one is quite um, convincing. I've known we've got a few of this and I was up in Kings Park looking at their nice grevillea, they've got a patch of grevilleas. I thought that looks familiar, took a photograph of it and it's amazingly similar. So it's likely that there were grevilleas. So we've got grevilleas, we've got banksias, but there are also other weird things. This is a leaf of a thing called Notophagus. Notophagus is the southern Antarctic beach Southern Antarctic beech is a rainforest tree, does not grow in this part of the world today because we have no rainforest in this part of Western Australia. That's the specimen I showed earlier. This is a beautiful block. It has a notophagus, a rainforest tree sitting next to a banksia. And this sums up this deposit. It's a mixture of things that are still around today that have survived the drying out of this part of the world over the last 20 or million years, plus rainforest elements that couldn't survive the drying out. So these are some Southern Antarctic beach. And when you look at the distribution of Notophagus today, it occurs Tasmania, Eastern States, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, even in South America, but not over here except in the fossil record. And there are a lot of other leaves. Again, as I said, this is very preliminary work because no detailed study has been done. These are leaves from my wife's garden, Sue's garden. This is Bacchausia, lemon myrtles, Motaceae. This is a magnolia and this is a macadamia. And here's one of the leaves from the deposit. And you can't see it awfully well, but when you look at the venation, on this. It's just like the venation on this fossil. So I suspect we might have had macadamias in Western Australia. Now macadamias have a fossil record going back about 70, 80 million years. There are even mac Evans for macadamia in Antarctica a long way back. So maybe we had macadamias here once. So there's a whole range of these different myrtaceous leaves that are really rainforest type leaves. There are also fruits in this deposit. Um, so you've got to think in the negative all the time. This is an impression of a fruit. That's about two centimeters. And here's a modern one. It's a casuarina type fruit, but it's a type of casuarina that's not around here today. It's called gymnostoma. It's a type that only grows in the rainforest. And they're quite common. So you can get these hard fruits preserved in this sort of environment. Um, and there are a number of different types. There are some true casuarinas, we think, but also this thing called gymnostoma. A gymnostoma is quite common in early deposits, about 40 million years old in other parts of Australia. Um, but today it's in rainforests in Queensland and, and New Guinea. 
And like many of the plants in this part of the world, it's so-called scleromorphic. They're adapted to nutrient-poor soils, but it isn't adapted to the drier conditions. It's not so-called xeromorphic, which means um, adapted to drought conditions. Come back to xeromorphic in a minute. Some of the other conifers, the good old aracariations, were around as well. And here we have these little fossils here. That's about a centimetre and a half. These are the cones, the male cones on a modern one. You can see just like these fossils. There are podocarps, these weird conifers called podocarps. These are quite common, and there's one in one of the specimens I brought along. And there are other things. There are monocotyledons. There's a palm-like thing. There might have been true cycads there as well. But it's, it's hard to tell just from um, single leaves. And there are lots of different fruits that we haven't the faintest idea what they are, but remain to be studied. Lots of unidentified leaves. Some of these are rainforest types, probably. <coughs> So some things are forms that are now not around today, not a vagus gymnostoma, which are rainforest elements, but other things that still grow in the area today. So it's this really interesting mix of forms that in some ways were pre-adapted to the drying out of the, the country. This one species of Banksia we described about four years ago called Banksia paleocrypta, and these show the stomata. Stomata are the little holes in leaves through which the plant will take and exhale gases, but also in which it can release water um, when it's um, transpiring. For plants that are want to retain their water, they often have sunken stomata. They protect them so they're not going to lose much water. And what we found in this particular banksia, fossil banksia, it had sunken stomata. So it was already, in a way, pre-adapted to the drying conditions that were to, to come along. And we think this is the earliest evidence in the fossil record of any flowering plant showing um, adaptation to drought conditions with these sunken stomata. But literally, this is the only... No, there have been two species described from this whole flora. There's another 30, 40, 50, who knows, still to be described. OK, now I'm nearly at the end, the very last deposit, and we've got even closer to home is Westdale. So we're up here somewhere, aren't we, in Kalamunda. Westdale's just out there, past Mount Dale. Again, the landowner contacted us, said, oh, I've got this really strange brown rock and there's some leaves in it. We were, what? Vroom. We were there in a flash and found this amazing flora, completely different rock type. Again, I brought one along. It's a silty rock, it's very fine-grained, and it's very brown. So this is brown because it's rich in iron. And the uh, brown iron oxide mineral is a mineral called goethite. It's very common. If you see a brown rock, it's caused by the mineral goethite. <coughs> in this, most of the leaf is, has been replaced by goethite and other strange minerals and has retained all the cellular structure. And it's, again, it contains a really interesting flora that is a mix of forms around today and ones that have gone. It's got ferns in it, so it must have been reasonably wet. Agathis, which is the cowrie pine. Retrophyllum is a podocarp, but then it's got banksia-type leaves. It's got this casuarina that's now only present in the rainforest. Agathis, Agathis named after my colleague at the museum for many years, George Kendrick, who helped with a lot of collecting a lot of this material. Here's the cowrie pine from New Zealand. If you look at the distribution of um, agathis, this particular type of aracariation, today um, it's in New Zealand, it's in <coughs> Queensland, Papua New Guinea, and up into Indonesia. It was around in WA because we had a much wetter, warmer climate going back 30, 40 million years. This is one of these podocarps. It's called retrophyllum. This is a modern day retrophyllum, and this has been identified by the people who have done. There's been one reasonable study done on this deposit, and they showed that this is retrophyllum. It's the most southerly known macrofossil of this particular genus, and the first record of it in Australia. As you can see today, it's only in Fiji, New Caledonia, and South America. Then we have this leaf here, which has been 
chomped into by something, something's had a go at it. <coughs> and this is a thing called Rhodomyrtus, or the rose myrtle. Today it only grows in Southeast Asia. 30 or million years ago, 40 million years ago, it was growing 60 kilometers from here. And this one, which has serrated edges on it, it's a thing called calicoma. Black wattle is one of its many common names. It's not a wattle, it's got wattle-like flowers. But you can see this leaf here, it's got serrated edges. It's just the same as this today. It's only in the rainforest, cool temperate rainforests in New South Wales. And this just shows some of the amazing preservation of this Westdale material. Um, the ones with the orange here, I think these are the fossils. This is modern plant material. These are scanning electron microscopes showing the stomata in the cells. And my colleagues who did this work reckon that they would often get a better photograph of the cellular material from the fossils than they did from the actual modern material. So beautifully preserved. So what does all this mean? Well, I've been sort of hammering it home a bit, I hope. In the light of 40 million billion years ago, the floras here were very different in some respects. A lot of these so-called myrtaceous leaves, <coughs> these rainforest type elements, but a lot of proteaceous, so crevillias and banksias, and probably other proteaceous forms as well. But a lot of these broadleaf rainforest elements, along as the, the conifers as well, a lot of them have these narrow, thick leaves. So these are forms that are so-called sclerophyllous. They're adapted to the very poor nutrient soils we have here today and had obviously in the past. But some of them, these adaptations made them pre-adapted for the drying conditions to resist drought or xeromorphy. So as Western Australia dried out, as the earth went into the ice age, it didn't get that cold here, it got cool, but it got very, very dry. Then it meant a lot of the rainforest elements disappeared. And so, as I say here, our fledgling macadamia industry was sadly not to be. So much higher annual rainfall and probably warmer in the winter. One little study that we did, I'm just about out of time. My student, Alex Stevens, carried out, and it was a very preliminary study, we should try it again, is there are some models that people have developed on floras around the world based on modern floras and fossil floras where you can work out from the whole flora, from the architecture of the leaf, rainfall, seasonality, temperatures in winter, in summer. And we applied that with the help of a guy in England who works on this to some of this material. And it sort of reinforced what we were saying. It came up with a suggestion which is maybe out of you know, it's a ballpark figure, but it may be exaggerated, of 3,000 millimetres in the summer. So it's a bit high, but then, you know, those sort of rainfalls do occur in some parts of Queensland occasionally. Anyway, this stuff is ripe for study, but then there are no paleobotanists in West, Western Australia. The only paleobotanist is, well, apart from people who work on spores and pollen, nobody works on the plant, the macro remains. The only person that did he was a fantastic guy called Steve McLaughlin, could never get a permanent job in Australia, and he's now in Sweden, where he's been for many years, because he couldn't get a job as a paleobotanist in this country. Nobody thinks they're important. So I'd like to thank lots of people, especially my wife Sue, sitting at the back, who's collected a lot of this material, who knows far more about plants than I ever will, because she's a botanist. Um, my children have helped with a lot of this collecting, and like most of my fossils, they've helped enormously. Alex Stevens, who did an honours thesis on the whalebing material, Shelley Cooper, who did an honours thesis on the cowberry material, Steve McLaughlin, who, when I don't know what something is, I send it to see Steve help, and he invariably gets back within about five or ten minutes. And Di Brooks, one of the many, but the latest, of the so called amateurs, the public, who found material and told us about it and enable these sort of discoveries to be made. And so we now have an enormous collection of these things in the Western Australian Museum, waiting for somebody to work on them in the future. Thank you.